Welcome everybody to today's High View Power webinar on long duration energy storage and its role in effective integration of renewables in New York. My name is Lara Kennedy. I'm with Mercom Communications and I'll be your facilitator for today's session and we'll introduce our expert presenter and moderator. Today's moderator is High View Power's Project Development Director, Richard Riley, and our presenter for today is Jamie Hussman. System Optimization and Analytics at Highview Power. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lara. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to very briefly uh, provide an intro to Highview Power and the technology, just as a backdrop to Jamie's analysis. Um, I could easily speak for an hour just about the technology, but I invite anyone who has deeper questions uh, to contact us following the webinar. So Highview Power is a designer and developer of long duration energy storage. Uh, we've been around for about 15 years um, and we've been developing a solution for storing energy in the medium of liquefied air. Um, the philosophy of this technology is to utilize uh, fully established uh, supply chains um, and equipment that is out of the catalog of existing uh, equipment suppliers so that we can provide a, a solution that's deployable through the existing project delivery structures. Um, I just wanted to sort of put the technology into context of the spectrum of energy storage technologies. So this is a, a rather oversimplified representation of some of the, uh, the most ubiquitous technologies that are talked about today. Um, but suffice to say that cryogenic energy storage and high views cryo battery modular system um, it's really uh, situated in the high power and long duration space. And when I say high power and long duration, I'm really talking about beyond four hours of storage and above 25 megawatts. Now, in comparison to incumbent technologies for storing uh, bulk uh, energy, um, such as pumped hydro and compressed air, the real differentiator um, is that the cryo battery system um, is entirely composed of above ground components and requires only firm flat ground to be deployed, um, which means that we are able to uh, leverage the locational value of energy storage um, by being more flexibly sited. Uh, we have a couple of uh, systems deployed already, a small pilot system that was the first cryogenic energy storage system in the world. Um, and then at the beginning of last summer, we commissioned our five megawatt uh, commercial demonstration facility um, that is currently operating and uh, providing grid services on a commercial basis to the UK national grid um, in, in England. Um, we, a couple of weeks ago, announced our first fully commercial full scale system, which is a 50 megawatt five hour system scheduled for completion in 2022. So how the technology works, as I mentioned, the whole philosophy is to rely upon existing componentry, um, which means that we are able to buy our components from, um, from existing OEMs with uh, warranty attached and what have you. And we're able to look to the field experience with those same components in other processes. So Highview doesn't actually build anything. We are experts in the integration of this equipment to uh, uh, provide a solution for long duration energy storage. So the first part of the system is derived from the industrial gas sector. It's a large industrial air liquefier, which has been used for over 100 years to produce gas products by distillation. Um, the way that that works is we take electricity from the grid and we run a very large uh, refrigeration system. It draws ambient air into it. Um, it strips moisture and uh, carbon dioxide out of the air. And then it cools that air down to cryogenic temperatures, whereupon it condenses into its liquid phase. Um, and the liquefied air that emerges from that process resembles liquid nitrogen because it predominantly is liquid nitrogen. It's 700 times denser than the air that we breathe. And most importantly, it emerges from the process at about 15 bar. So that low pressure fluid is therefore very cost effectively stored in thin walled steel vessels that are well thermally insulated. And that is what allows us to uh, site the storage medium above ground um, and easily site our uh, technology. 
So we have liquid air in those tanks. They resemble essentially large thermos flasks. Um, at the smaller scale, you'll see these kind of tanks outside hospitals with liquid oxygen in them, and at the larger scale uh, on LNG facilities. When we want to recover the energy from the system, we extract the liquid air, we pump it up to high pressure using a cryogenic pump. Um, we reintroduce heat, and the result is a high pressure, high temperature gas, and we can expand that gas through a turbine, um, which turns a synchronous generator and puts electricity back onto the grid. Uh, in order to achieve efficiency in this system, we're operating on an adiabatic uh, process. So we're recovering the heat of compression in the refrigeration system. We're using that to extract more energy from every pound of liquid air that we have in our tanks. And in a similar manner, when we take liquid air and we raise it to ambient pressure, uh, ambient temperature, sorry, we uh, can extract that cold and we can store it and deliver it later to the uh, refrigeration process. And it does a lot of the cooling in that refrigeration process. So the heat and the cold stores are also uh, thin walled steel vessels. So all of the storage components are uh, basically a volume of tankage. Uh, in this uh, configuration with the careful thermal integration um, that we've been developing over the past years, um, we're able to achieve a round trip efficiency of about 60% round trip. The three components of the system are entirely independent from one another. So um, what this effectively means is that if we want to build out the duration of the system, we're simply multiplying the volume of tankage and that's very low cost. And it's this dynamic that drives the technology into the long duration space. And then on the power side, um, the uh, rule of thumb for uh, this kind of process equipment is if you double the megawatt rating of the equipment, you increase the cost by only 50%. And that basically means that we have significant economies of scale from building bigger in terms of megawatts as well as megawatt hours. Okay, so before I pass over to Jamie, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context on the analysis and why we undertook to do this analysis. And I hope it will provide some interesting food for thought um, and um, some interesting feedback at the end of the, the webinar. Um, so we know that long duration energy storage has uh, a number of uh, benefits to the grid, uh, namely the ability to shift large amounts of energy over long durations, and also the ability to provide a reliability backstop in replacement of fossil generation. And there have been a number of uh, interesting studies that have highlighted that costs are critical when it comes to long duration, and in particular, the cost of the energy component. And we wanted to take that and develop a deeper understanding of the dynamics of uh, cost and efficiency uh, for long duration applications by looking at the complete chain of renewable generation by uh, variable resources, all the way through to delivery to the consumer at the correct time. Um, and New York provides an interesting case study and a manageable case study for this, uh, uh, for evaluating this problem, namely by uh, virtue of the construct of the grid, which is reasonably simple in a zonal uh, zonal grid structure, and also by the fact that um, New York has very explicit targets and future scenarios for renewable build-outs that provide useful uh, baselines for this kind of analysis. So we've taken that and we framed a problem around specifically the question of renewable curtailment, um, essentially asking the question, if renewables are going to be curtailed, how can storage unlock that otherwise trapped energy and deliver it to the consumer cost effectively. And so in order to evaluate uh, the dynamics of uh, cryogenic energy storage, we've evaluated it looking at both that technology and lithium ion as uh, a well understood comparative technology. So we're essentially looking at uh, a deployment of a portfolio of cryogenic energy storage in lithium in order to understand what that looks like. Um, so we will take questions during the webinar and uh, field them at the end of uh, Jamie's presentation. If any particularly pertinent questions come up um, during the presentation, I will uh, uh, bring them up as we go. Um, 
worth mentioning that this analysis has also been presented in poster form, which is available on Highview's website and may be a useful reference for attendees. So I shall now pass over to Jamie. Okay, well, thank you very much, Richard, for that introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to uh, thank you guys for joining us in this webinar uh, today. So as Richard already mentioned, um, we're presenting a case study that um, assesses the role of low cost, long duration energy storage versus higher efficiency, short duration technologies uh, within the context of New York State's clean energy goals. So we're specifically looking at curtailment of renewable energy within this uh, New York grid. And, um, and these technologies are being evaluated, as Richard mentioned, on how they can uh, address this, is this issue of curtailment. So uh, just a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so firstly, I'm going to provide uh, a little bit of background on why we're looking at uh, New York's grid in particular. Um, and uh, then I'll rehash the main object, uh, state the main objectives that we're trying to accomplish with this, with this case study. Uh, then we're going to go through the model that we put together uh, to solve these objectives. And finally, we'll dive into the results in, uh, in detail. So there's three main reasons why we're kind of looking at uh, the New York grid. Um, so firstly, for those of you who aren't really familiar with the New York control area, uh, most deregulated markets in the US um, prices are settled on uh, nodes. And these nodes generally represent uh, substations or generators. And these markets will have thousands of these nodes. Um, whereas in New York, uh, the area, uh, or the, the prices rather, are settled on within these load zones. And New York only has 11 load zones. Uh, here you can see the, uh, a map of where they are. And, um, so from a, a modeling perspective, it's a lot easier to deal with um, with 11 load zones as opposed to thousands of nodes, of course. Um, so secondly, New York within one grid, it kind of has two grids. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, upstate and the uh, in the upstate zones, zones A to E, um, that's where the vast majority of renewable capacity is. Uh, in 2018, nearly 88% of renewable generation in the state was in those regions. Um, on the other hand, downstate in the load pockets uh, where New York City and Long Island's located, um, more than two thirds of electricity was consumed in that region, zones F through K. So uh, there's kind of a tale of two grids within New York. And the transmission infrastructure connecting these two regions is fairly minimal. It only represents about 25% of uh, the peak load seen in 2018 in, uh, in the downstate region. So as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of curtailment issues associated with getting that renewable downstate. And as the grid moves more and more towards 100% renewables, which New York has mandated, and I'll get into that uh, in the next slide, um, the, that congestion issue will be exacerbated. Uh, and um, without additional transmission upgrades. And just to be clear on this analysis, we're not really considering uh, transmission upgrades at all. Um, so the other kind of solutions to this issue would be uh, renewables closer to the to the to the uh, loads load regions, and um, that would most likely be done with offshore wind. And we're going to include that in the analysis. And then, of course, energy storage. Um, 
uh, energy storage deploy the demand side or the supply side, upstate or downstate, to help uh, manage this curtailed energy. So the, uh, the third reason we're looking at New York is because it has uh, the most or one of the most aggressive clean energy targets in the country. Um, so 2025, the state's mandated six gigawatts of behind the meter solar and 1.5 gigawatts of storage. 2030, 70% um, of load has to be served by renewable energy and that 1.5 gigawatts of energy storage will become three gigawatts. In 2035, um, nine gigawatts of offshore wind has been mandated. And finally, in 2040, all, um, all of the generation on the grid has to be zero carbon. So, uh, so for this analysis, we're gonna be focusing on 2025. Um, the reason for that is because uh, that's the first milestone when you see energy storage or significant deployment of energy storage popping up on the grid. And additionally, uh, it's, it's harder to kind of forecast what the grid will look like later uh, in 10, 15, 20 years. So we wanted to look at the first, uh, the first main milestone. So with that, um, we're trying to, in this case study, we're comparing short and long duration storage technologies by answering uh, two main questions. So firstly, what is the optimal portfolio of storage to economically reduce curtailment of renewable energy as more renewables come on the grid? And that portfolio of storage consists of two technologies. Uh, one, long duration technology, cryogenic energy storage, and a short duration technology, lithium ion. And as Richard alluded to before, what makes cryogenic energy storage uh, optimal for long durations is its low marginal installed cost of energy, uh, $50 per kilowatt hour, compared to lithium ion, uh, which is almost four times higher than that for building out the cells. And just to be clear, that number is for, is forecasted for 2025. And uh, these dollars per kilowatt hour represent only the capital costs of, of, uh, of um, the energy component. It doesn't include the, the charge and the discharge components. And the second problem that we're gonna look at addressing is the second question is how much storage can be deployed cost effectively to address this problem and for that we're going to attempt to quantify the cost of dollars per megawatt hour of liberating uh, this curtailed energy and compare that to a, a benchmark um, using uh, the lcoe of renewable energies so in the next part of the presentation uh, i'm going to introduce the, the model that we put together to address these problem, these uh, objectives. And that model is a two-stage model. So in the first stage, uh, we set out to establish a baseline. And what I mean by that is um, we wanna model the grid in 2025 without any additional storage upgrades to have a reference of how much curtailment of renewable energy there will be. Uh, and then in, this, in the next stage, we're gonna introduce storage to see how it can address this problem. So before I dive into the model, um, I just wanted to lay out the renewable energy capacity assumptions that went into modeling the uh, New York State's 2025 electricity grid. So I've included below uh, the, the numbers for 2018, just so you can see how much they have to increase to, to get to this. And uh, so these numbers come from a variety of publicly available sources, um, various New York ISO reports uh, that we gathered from the internet. And uh, 
So what we've kind of concluded is that in, in 2025, there will be about 8.5 gigawatts of onshore wind and utility scale PV. And as you can see, most of that will be, uh, will be concentrated upstate. So it, that will clearly exacerbate the problem of, uh, of congestion. Um, we've also included offshore wind that's already been procured. Um, and that offshore wind will land in New York City and Long Island and is expected to be deployed by 2025. And finally, we've included uh, behind the meter solar based on uh, New York State's mandate six gigawatts of storage in the state of, sorry, behind the meter PV in the state. And we've used publicly some of these reports to kind of break down where that is across the grid, but it's generally follows uh, population. So as I mentioned, um, the first modeling stage is to establish a baseline of how much uh, curtailment there is with no additional storage. So the first thing we did was we uh, constructed uh, hourly load and generation profiles uh, broken down by zones uh, to input into the model using uh, some of these numbers I showed before. So uh, for the load profile, we looked at 2018 hourly data um, from New York ISO, and we scaled that to uh, forecast the demand in 2025. And zonally. Then we subtracted energy efficiency improvements, also forecasted by zone in 2025, and distributed PV. And we used NRAIL's PV Watts tool to uh, get locational um, PV profiles for each zone based on the capacities you saw on the previous slide. And similarly, we did that with the generation profile for, uh, we used NREL tools to generate locational wind onshore and offshore. Uh, and solar profiles scaled by those megawatt capacity numbers you saw broken down by zone. And on top of that, we included base load generation that's expected to uh, still be online in 2025, um, mostly nuclear and combined cycle plants. And we also included uh, hydro as base load. Um, there's about 4.2 gigawatts of hydro and mostly in upstate New York. And uh, we included imports from Quebec and Ontario, and a little. There's two major pump, fill, pumped hydro facilities in the state that we included. And then finally, uh, the supply demand balance um, is assumed to be met to be achieved with uh, peaking plants. And just to kind of visualize what this data looks like, I've included a little graphic of uh, the data frame. Uh, for the example profile of load, um, where each column represents a zone and uh, the, the 11 zones, and the rows are the timestamps every hour. And you can see how um, we're clearly capturing the, the time effects of uh, intermittent generation and uh, the, the shape of the load profile. Um, so the model that we constructed is a linear program uh, built in Python, um, solved using the Groby optimization engine. And uh, so the way the model works is it, uh, it um, so the, each zone has an hourly, has its load profile and its generation profile. And every hour the model attempts to meet uh, supply with demand. Um, and if there's an oversupply of energy in that particular hour, then the model can send that electricity to a, another zone um, within the uh, transmission limits of that connection. And those transmission limits are based on uh, transmission infrastructure forecasts for 2025, what the, what the network will look like. Um, if there's ever any uh, if there's a there's curtailment when the lines are congested, uh, of course. And on the other hand, um, if the demand, if there's not enough supply to meet the demand, then uh, we assume that's being met by, by peaking plant dispatch. And what the optimizer is actually doing, what the objective function is, 
is to minimize the peaking plant dispatch for the entire New York control area. So we ran the model for 2025 and uh, calculated 14 terawatt hours of uh, renewable curtailment. And that represents about a quarter of the renewable energy generation or potential generation. And that curtailment arises from uh, lack of load. So in, so in a particular hour, if in the entire New York uh, control area, there's more supply than demand, then it's curtailed, or uh, interzonal transmission constraints. So if uh, the transmission lines out of a zone are fully congested, uh, the load is being met by the generation, and there's still some over, there's still some generation. So I included this, uh, this graphic on the right, um, a pie chart just showing the annual megawatt hours of generation. What I wanted to uh, point out is that, um, so the optimizer is, as I mentioned, minimizing uh, peaking dispatch. But there still is a substantial amount of uh, peaking to be displaced. And when we introduce storage in the next step of the, uh, in the next stage of the model, um, the, the storage is gonna free up some of that curtailment from that 14 terawatt hours and eat into the peaking, uh, eat into that peaking generation. So now that we've established the baseline, uh, we can introduce storage to, to the mix and look at the, the next stage of the model. Um, so the way that we, we uh, include storage is, uh, so for a given target reduction in curtailment, so we constrain the model to a, a target reduction in curtailment relative to the baseline, uh, relative to that 14 terawatt hours. And the way the model achieves that is by deploying a portfolio of storage across the zones. Um, so for example, if we wanted to run a model with uh, half a terawatt hour of uh, curtailment reduction, the model will deliver 14 minus 0.5, 13.5 terawatt hours of uh, curtailment and deploy whatever storage portfolio is the most cost optimal. Um, and so the way that's done in the model is um, we introduce new variables describing a storage portfolio for each zone. And that is comprised of uh, cryogenic energy storage and lithium ion. And so for each technology in each zone, the model can uh, solve for uh, the charging capacity, discharging capacity. Um, so for lithium ion, that's gonna be the same, but for cryogenic energy storage, they, uh, they're decoupled so they can be different. And also the duration, the energy component. Um, and it varies those for the, that, that's what affects the overall cost of the portfolio. And in addition to that, uh, the optimizer can vary the, um, the actual dispatch profile of each of these uh, storage technologies in each zone. And that's where the efficiency of each technology is accounted for. Um, and additionally, that's how the optimizer actually achieves the target reduction in curtailment. So to quantify uh, this cost reduction, we introduced uh, a new metric um, called the levelized cost of curtailment avoided. And if you're familiar with the levelized cost of energy, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, the only difference is that rather than in the denominator having uh, the lifetime energy production of whatever asset you're looking at, um, it, you have the we have the lifetime avoided curtailment of uh, said model solution. So what we constrain the model to, and uh, this is over a 30-year horizon, um, and we're using a discount factor of 12%. And, and the numerator, uh, it's just the lifetime portfolio cost of the entire New York grid, whatever storage is deployed. So that will include the capital cost of the uh, cryo battery or lithium ion, the OPEX. And uh, you'll notice um, the, the term R, the non-energy revenue. 
So for the sake of the optimization, that's set to zero. But later in the presentation, when we take a more holistic view of storage, uh, we're going to examine other revenue streams to lower the LCOCA, going from a gross LCOCA to a net LCOCA. Uh, so before I move on to the results, I just want to cover the limit, some of the major limitations of the model. Um, so we've, we cover, so the model considers interzonal transmission. So transmission between zone A and B, but what's not covered is intrazonal transmission. And that would be transmission within zone A. So we assume that all of the generation in zone A is able to meet all of the load in zone A. Um, and when in reality, that's probably, that's not necessarily the case. There's some transmission that could be congested. Um, so we're not capturing those, those constraints. Additionally, as I mentioned, we're only looking at uh, storage. We're not really, we're not looking at transmission upgrades. Um, this is a, it's not a co-optimization of non-energy value of storage. So as I had mentioned, as I just mentioned, um, that our term is being set to zero, the non-energy revenues. And we'll later get into that. Uh, and how we capture them as a post-process. And finally, uh, we're assuming that uh, citing storage in each zone is is the same, where that's probably not the case. Um, it would be more difficult to deploy a battery in New York City and downtown Manhattan versus uh, in rural New York, upstate New York. So now we're going to uh, dive into the results. So, uh, so firstly, we're going to address the, the first objective of the, of the uh, case study. What is the optimal storage portfolio look like? And then we're going to look at how much storage can be deployed cost effectively. So we ran the model uh, in, we constrained the model to, uh, in increments of 0 0.5 terawatt hours and ran it five times. And uh, here I've plotted the results of uh, the grid wide capacity of cryo and lithium ion that the optimizer deploys to achieve said uh, curtailment avoidance. So, uh, so for the first iteration for 0 0.5 terawatt hours, the model uh, the model deploys 655 megawatts of storage, and uh, that is 100% cryogenic energy storage. And that, that makes sense because uh, cryogenic energy storage is the more cost effective solution. So, for, uh, for the kind of the low hanging fruit, um, the early curtailment avoidance, that's it's easy to, to pick that up. And then as we add we want to avoid more and more curtailment and move down across that x-axis. Um, more and more uh, lithium ion starts uh, representing more of that market the deployment. Um, and that's because as, uh, as we uh, need to avoid more curtailment, the efficiency starts to become slightly more important. And uh, so what's not shown here and what we'll get into in the next slide is uh, the actual megawatt hours, the duration that uh, is solved for. And I just want to clarify that we also haven't considered the costs of each of these uh, solutions. So to avoid 2.5 terawatt hours and deploy 4.5 gigawatts might not make any sense. And we'll get to that later as well. Um, so we're we want to calibrate the model to New York State's target storage deployment. And uh, as I mentioned, that's 1.5 gigawatts by 2025. So in the model run where we avoided one terawatt hour of curtailment, um, it deploys very close to that 1.4 gigawatts. So we're going to be examining this uh, specific case for the next, the next few, few slides. So here from that 1.5 gigawatts, um, I've plotted 
the zonal breakdown across the grid of what these uh, on the top, what the the discharge capacities look like for each technology, and on the bottom, what the uh, duration looks like. And what's interesting here is that, so with regards to duration, um, for lithium ion, the, it seems to be the model seems to be solving for about three to four hour, three to five hours of of discharge, which is exactly in line with what we'd expect. Um, for cryogenic energy storage, uh, there's a bit of a it, it varies across the regions. Um, in upstate New York, it ranges from 14 to 16 hours, which reflects the the shape of the generation. Uh, PV and uh, wind which represents the majority of that. And then downstate, um, where most of the storage is being deployed, it's slightly lower uh, duration between eight and 10 hours, or six and 10 hours. And that reflects uh, the shape of the load. So now I wanted to take a, a deeper dive into zone K from this. Uh, from just to be clear, from this solution. Uh, so I chose three or two random days in February um, and plotted the hourly generation mix just to see what exactly is happening. Um, and so as you can see, uh, so there's about 375 megawatts of PV. Um, on the first day, there's some cloud coverage, so not all of it gets through. Uh, then there's about 500 megawatt hour, megawatts of uh, combined cycle, the thermal base load. Um, interestingly enough, most of the generation is uh, coming from out of, from out of the zone. Uh, it's transmission probably from upstate. And in some hours, it even get, it, that even uh, reaches its limits. Uh, that's of 1.5 1, 1. gigawatts. That line, the lines coming in are congested. Then on top of that, uh, there's the offshore wind in the state. Um, it seems to die down in the uh, first half of the second day. And then finally, we have the, uh, the batteries discharging, the, the lithium ion and the cryo battery. And, and what I find interesting with this is, uh, so that morning peak is, is about three to four hours long. And the model is opting to deploy lithium ion to meet that peak or meet part of that peak with the wind. And then it's able to charge a little bit during the day um, from that offshore wind that goes over the, the load and, um, and discharge during the, the longer peak in the afternoon. But most of that longer peak is being met by cryo batteries. And that's where the six or seven hour uh, duration requirement is coming into play. And that's why we see that. And then that very last hour, the batteries aren't able to meet that. So you have a uh, fossil fuel peaker being fired up for that last hour. So now um, moving on to the second objective, how much storage can we actually deploy cost effectively. And for that, we take uh, more of a, a holistic view to storage and we look at non-energy revenues. So we're gonna revisit the LCOE, LCOCA uh, equation. If you, if you remember that R term, the non-energy revenues. So before we set that to zero for the optimization, but now we're gonna include uh, capacity revenue and synchronous reserve. And um, the way we did that was, firstly, I just wanna be clear that this was a post-process. These revenues were not included in the optimization. Um, so we looked at uh, 2018 clearing prices for New York State's capacity market and 10 minute synchronous reserve, uh, those prices, and we just applied them to uh, the, that breakdown of, of storage. So how that looks is, um, 
here you can see this waterfall diagram. Uh, so we have the, the gross LCOCA, which is what the model is actually optimizing for. There's no uh, additional non-energy revenues included in that number. And it's fairly high. I mean, it's not really comparable to any, uh, any LCOE numbers uh, for renewables. But then when we include sync and the capacity payment, um, we're able to bring that down to the order of magnitude that we'd expect, uh, $47 per megawatt hour. And this, that number, this, is, this is for the uh, 1.5 gigawatt uh, solution, the one terawatt hour of curtailment avoidance, just to be clear. So now that brings me to uh, the question, how much storage can we actually deploy? And so we re revisit this, uh, this bar graph showing the different solutions um, for various avoided curtailment. And uh, now you'll notice that I've included a line that uh, corresponds to the LCOCA, the net LCOCA with those additional revenues um, for each solution. And you'll also notice the dotted line that represents the LCOE of offshore wind. And for that, we just used Lazard 12.0, and we took uh, the midpoint of, of their range. It's about $92 per megawatt hour. And so to determine how much storage can be deployed cost-effectively, we use that as the benchmark. And um, we see where where those two lines meet. And uh, with that, um, about two gigawatts of storage can be deployed uh, at that LCOCA. And of course, this is, uh, we, we, we kind of just use this as a calibration of the model to, to see if we're able to achieve numbers that we kind of expect close to, uh, uh, to reality. And with, with that, we can avoid about 1.4 terawatt hours of curtailment. So just so to summarize quickly, um, we've, uh, we've framed a simple problem to uh, compare short and long duration storage technologies um, within New York State's grid. Um, so without any additional storage, 49% uh, of load can be served by renewable energy and uh, half of, or about a quarter of that renewable energy is, uh, represents curtailment, it's 14 terawatt hours. Um, when we introduce storage, that optimal portfolio uh, consists of mostly long duration, low cost storage, uh, and that's supplemented by some higher efficiency, higher cost storage. And when we look at the, the cost of storage and take a, a holistic view, we can, we can see that New York State can deploy anywhere from 1.5 to 2 gigawatts cost effectively to, uh, to address this problem. So now I'm going to hand it back to, to Richard uh, to field any questions. Thank you, Jamie. Good job. Um, so <clears throat> we have a few questions here. Um, I'll start with some of the, the simpler ones. So we've got a few people asking if the presentation will be made available. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, the webinar is also being recorded and will be made available uh, following. And I remind you that there's also a poster on the subject um, that is available on Highview's website as well. Um, so we have a question for clarification from Andrew Parr. Um, on the question of the $50 per kilowatt hour cost mentioned earlier in the presentation, asking whether it's supposed to be kilowatt hour or megawatt hour. Um, so I think I can answer that. Um, this is the marginal installed cost of the energy component of a cryogenic energy storage system. It's not to be confused with the levelized cost of storage. So for every additional kilowatt hour in terms of volume of tankage needed, um, the cost is about $50. Um, we have another question uh, asking about uh, the challenges that we anticipate 
participate for uh, environmental permitting of this technology in the US. Um, broadly speaking, uh, the, the technology is using uh, processes that exist already in many contexts within the US, including urban contexts, so air liquefaction and power generation. Um, it doesn't have any uh, combustible materials. Um, so generally, we see the uh, permitting for this technology as a question of education rather than any uh, particular technical barriers. Um, so a question for Jamie, um, why did we not include frequency regulation in the non-energy value analysis? Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so the thing with frequency regulation, um, specifically for uh, lithium ion, is that because of the rapid cycling, it drastically reduces the useful lifetime of the technology. So um, going back to that LCOCA, uh, the, that net, the gross LCOCA that the optimizer is minimizing, we used a 30 year lifetime um, for both technologies. So we would have to uh, alter that and it would get a little bit messy. Okay. And I think that would be some future work that Jamie will be looking into. So um, uh, we have a couple of questions uh, along the lines of why, why is lithium ion selected at all, given that cost is the main driver um, for long duration? Well, I would say we've, we've framed the problem around um, longer and shorter duration um, you know, applications. It's, it's not in itself a long duration problem. Um, and what it shows really is that um, uh, high efficiency but more expensive technologies are able to do uh, well in the shorter time scale. So if you examine the dispatch um, as we did earlier, you can see that over shorter time scales, uh, the lithium ion uh, plays well. But when you need sustained duration, um, you need to do that at the lowest possible cost that's where uh, the cryo comes in. So it really is just highlighting that um, energy storage is not a, a, a homogenous um, uh, asset class um, and that different technologies play different roles within the grid. Um, so we have a question. Um, the results show that 14 terawatt hours would be curtailed without storage and that with storage we can uh, according to this analysis, effectively uncurtail 1.5 terawatt hours. How can we go further to uh, 14 terawatt hours of curtailment, Jamie? Yeah, so um, as, I, as I mentioned, we didn't consider transmission upgrades um, in this analysis. But of course, those will play a, a major role in uh, reducing curtailment, uh, connecting the kind of far off uh, remote uh, renewable generators to, to the load centers. And that will also make it easier for uh, storage to kind of manage the congestion within that. Okay, we have a question. Uh, was there, where was the cutoff point in hours between lithium ion and cryo storage? I think the question is, was there an imposed limit to duration for e any of the technologies? Uh, the answer to that is no, there was not. Um, that was just simply, uh, the, the solution that the optimizer chose based on costs. And uh, it seems to agree with what we, we'd expect and what we see in reality. So we have another question. Why is offshore wind used as the comparator price? Um, the answer to that is that uh, offshore wind is a good indicator of what New York State is prepared to pay for energy. Um, and offshore wind uh, can only really provide energy, not so much uh, additional non-energy services. So you can evaluate on a number of bases, but we chose offshore wind simply because it is a benchmark for uh, an acceptable cost of energy. Uh, in your analysis, did you consider 10 year life for batteries versus 30 to 40 year life for cryogenic energy storage? Uh, so the way we considered, uh, so. Let me just first state that. So cryogenic energy storage generally has a useful lifetime of 30 years. So to um, be consistent, we uh, oversize the battery using Lazard's approach um, every year so that it would 
uh, last for 30 years as well. Thank you. Um, how did you incorporate pumped hydro facilities in the model? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so, in the in the first stage of the modeling um, for establishing a baseline, uh, we um, so we included two pumped hydro facilities in the state. Um, I think one is about one gigawatt, ten hours. Another is about two hundred megawatts, ten hours. Um, we assumed a round-trip efficiency of 73%, and uh, we um, used a similar approach to uh, when we included storage later in the model, where we left free variables for the optimizer to, uh, to find the optimal dispatch uh, throughout the, for the model. So that actually ended up reducing curtailment um, even before we introduced uh, the additional kind of lithium-ion and cryogenic storage. Okay, we have a question. Uh, at the beginning, you mentioned that transmission upgrade is not considered. Is there a reason for this? Um, so to clarify, I, I believe that the transmission upgrades already planned were considered in the model. Yes, correct. Um, but what we did not do was uh, evaluate transmission as an alternative to uh, curtailment reduction. And that's an absolutely legitimate question. Obviously, uh, part of the solution of minimizing curtailment is to reinforce transmission. And there are a number of interesting projects in New York to, uh, to uh, improve transmission, particularly between upstate and downstate. Um, but I think the results kind of highlight that there is a role for energy storage to play um, and that it can work with transmission um, to uh, maximize the delivery of clean energy uh, to load. Um, it becomes a much more complex problem when thinking about transmission and transmission obviously is very hard to, to develop and permit. Um, so uh, this is definitely something for consideration. Um, further questions. Um, would we expect a similar result in other markets across the US? Um, yeah, that's, that's another good question. Uh, so generally, um, renewable assets such as solar and wind are located far away from load centers. So you will have a lot of congestion kind of getting it in, um, bringing it closer to load. Uh, you see that in, in the Midwest, in the wind corridor or in Kansas, um, there's a lot of issues with congestion already. Uh, so yes, you would see uh, similar, similar kind of effects and results but maybe not as extreme. New York is certainly an extreme example of, uh, of these two grids within one. Um, we have a question, does New York State import a lot of power from other states and could you model this? Uh, yes, it does. Um, New York imports, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it's a number of gigawatts of hydro from Ontario and from Quebec. And we have included that in the model. Um, we've included that just as base load uh, coming in every hour. And I think New York also imports electricity from PJM, and, but that's mostly uh, fossil fuels. So that we have not included in the analysis. How do you think the picture would change if you optimize, when you optimize energy and non-energy value of storage and you develop that portfolio optimization considering capacity, spinning reserve, frequency regulation, et cetera. So, um, so with regard to spinning reserve, I don't think the results would change by much. Um, you might see slightly higher capacities, uh, but for the capacity market, um, that really is a function of what the uh, minimum requirement is for, for said market based on reliability. If it's a four hour requirement then uh, versus a 10 hour requirement. So it's, it's really hard to say. Thank you. Um, how would storage deployed for this purpose be contracted? So we have actually uh, looked quite carefully at this and I think the answer is it will, it will change over, the t over time, but 
at present, if we consider the offshore wind um, deployments in New York, uh, the wind uh, farm um, developers are isolated from the effect of uh, indiscriminately uh, sending energy into the grid um, in the downstate uh, um, regions. And so there's no incentive on them to uh, build energy storage. So we, we expect the uh, appearance of several gigawatts of offshore wind in the first instant to manifest uh, directly in the wholesale market by depressing prices. Um, which is a bit of a challenge because it means that uh, the value of operating in the way that this model has um, uh, uh, essentially determined is going to be uh, all around uh, merchant operations. So buying energy while it's uh, cheap and selling it while it's expensive. Um, and so that provides a bit of a financing uh, challenge, um, not insurmountable. Um, the, the value will, will exist. And I think um, uh, apart from that, the capacity market will likely be uh, uh, the, the key core of uh, uh, contractable value uh, in that kind of configuration. Um, we have a question, how does one store energy from wind or solar PV into a high view cryo battery? So a high view cryo battery just operates on uh, AC electrical power. So uh, any source of AC electrical power is, is capable of charging the system. In theory, it can also run on direct current, um, but ultimately the way that we're envisaging uh, the deployment in this context is that it will be connected directly to the AC grid. Um, that will power the compressors of the refrigeration cycle, and then it will discharge through the synchronous generator on the discharge side. So it's, it's effectively completely agnostic to the original source of the energy. Uh, of the electrical energy. Um, we are just coming up to the hour. I think we have 60 seconds left. So um, I think we have time for just one more question um, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. So um, we have a question here. What duration did the optimizer solve over? Was it all 8,760? hours in a year? I think the simple answer to that is yes, it was. So it was an hourly resolution uh, optimizing uh, for energy uh, dispatch, so balancing load and, and, um, and generation for every hour of, of one year. Okay, um, thank you everybody for joining the webinar. Uh, very much appreciate your attention. I hope it was interesting. We look forward to feedback. Um, uh, this is really intended to spark discussion around the different uh, roles of energy storage. Um, and uh, we look forward to speaking more. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar. We really appreciate your time. Again, uh, the emails are listed here on the slide. If you have any questions, please reach out directly. And again, uh, we do appreciate you joining us today.